Hi, I'm Liz and I'm making this video to send to my school board. Um, the school board actually only accepts written letters and so I'm hopeful that they will watch this instead because I feel like I can communicate this better uh, in this format than in the format of um, a, a, a letter. So thank you if you are on the school board for taking a few minutes out of your day to watch this. I hope that it provides some explanation of what some of the parents are going through and feeling um, this year as we're going into the 2021-22 school year. So last year, um, the board agreed to provide a virtual option for kids because of COVID-19. And my family was one of the families that took advantage of that. Uh, we have kind of unique medical circumstances in our household. My husband has several severe respiratory diseases. He's not even 40, but he's on supplemental oxygen and has been for years. And um, we were able to safely educate our home, children at home last year while keeping him safe from contracting COVID. Because if he contracted it pre-vaccination, it was gonna be a life or death situation. So under the recommendation of several doctors, we chose to partake in an extended and pretty strict lockdown. School was not safe for us as a family because no interaction with the public was safe for us until he was vaccinated. So we were very grateful for the virtual program and I wanna thank you for making that, making that an option last year. Now, late winter, Ben and I were both able to get vaccinated and we could begin to relax some of those limitations that we had had on our family. Um, it, would, it had not been an easy year. You know, we were isolated from family and friends and church and school. But even so, when the district announced that there would be no virtual option in the fall of 2021, I was like, that's okay. I'm not troubled by that. Vaccinations were proving to be effective. COVID numbers were on the decline. And I knew that the school's language of in-person education and safe was built on the protocols that had been put into place last year. Masking, social distancing in the classroom and hallways, quarantine procedures, contact tracing, limited visitors, things like that. Now, I did find that repeated language of in-person education is safe to be somewhat critical in its phrasing. I was probably a little defensive of, of our family's decision, um, but I decided to let that go. It seemed sometime like it was a criticism of families like ours who decided that school wasn't safe for us last year. But I mean, we knew we had to stand by our decision. In addition to keeping the kid's dad alive, we also did not want to burden our kids with unearned and unnecessary guilt. If they contracted COVID at school, got sick and recovered, but gave it to their dad before he'd had a chance to be vaccinated, I mean, the mental health impacts of that I don't even want to think about it, right? And so for a lot of families, there were very, very real physical and mental health risks to sending kids to school last year. So again, virtual program was good, but we're thinking things are on the right track. We don't need it this year. And so I get that. But here's the thing. The language of in-person education is safe only works if we look at two requirements. One, we have to actually do what's necessary to keep kids safe. Like we can't pretend things are safe because we want them to be. You know, in our school district has spent a lot of money to secure our schools and, and move the offices so that there's better security um, in terms of the layout. We have better locks. We participate in the background check programs that we're required to do, right? We recognize that we can't just hope that things are safe. We have to make things safe. So that's the first thing we have to do to have in-person education be safe. We have to make it safe. And two, it can only be true if we make sure that we understand that we are only talking about the children themselves, not their families, okay? Yes, most children who contract COVID are going to be fine. But the ongoing impacts of contracting COVID, the contagion to family members, high-risk community members, etc. I mean, there are risks. There are community-based risks. So at the start of this school year, circumstances have changed significantly from last spring. COVID numbers are increasing and the Delta variant is far more contagious than previous versions. I was shocked when I saw the COVID precautions that have been in place last year, the COVID precautions that were the foundation of in-person education is safe, were completely gutted from the 21-22 school year plan. No masks, no social distancing, visitors welcome. In fact, there is even language in our plan that says that we do not anticipate quarantine to be an issue this year. It almost seems as if the current plan is based on wishful thinking that COVID has gone away or is not a threat to our children. COVID has not gone away and it is a threat to our children. 
Last week, 71,000 children in the United States tested positive for COVID. That is double the amount from the previous week and five times the amount from June. Now, only one to 2% of kids who contract COVID end up being hospitalized with complications. Some kids also experience long-term complications weeks and months later. But here's the thing, as the number of cases go up, the cumulative number of children who are going to be hospitalized is also going to climb. We are going to see more children hospitalized, more children with severe impacts of COVID. Our, sorry, it's hard to kind of go through all of this and I wanna make sure I get it all right. Our vaccination rates in our area are low and I do appreciate the efforts that the district has put into encouraging faculty and staff to get vaccinated before the school year. I'm troubled that I've seen no efforts to communicate the potential of vaccines to actually keep our kids safely in school to eligible students and their families. I would love to see us not include language that just says vaccines are not required and instead have language like vaccines are not required, but please talk to your doctor if you are eligible because the higher our vaccine percentage, the more likely we are to be able to stay safely in school. Masks are an effective tool against COVID spread. We know this, okay? They are an inconvenience and they are politically unpopular. And I certainly enjoyed my mask-free summer as a vaccinated adult. However, masks are one of the only tools we have to keep our kids safe. And that's especially true at the elementary level where 100% of students under the age of 12 have not yet been vaccinated. Elimination of the virtual option combined with eliminating basic safety protocols is an upsetting combination of actions. I want my kids in school this year. I want them in person. I also recognize that we are disingenuous in our language of in-person education is safe if we do not do our best to make it so. School districts that are continuing to function in our area without mask mandates are experiencing huge surges in the number of cases and the number of quarantine exposure, quarantines for exposure. School districts that are listening to the CDC and the World Health Organization and the Indiana State Department of Health and the American Academy of Pediatrics, they're hopefully going to be able to experience a far safer school year and a more consistent school year by masking the population and keeping kids in school. Children are resilient. They did find the vast majority of them with a mask policy last year. Please reinstitute it. If there are students who need an exception because of their physical or mental health, we could create a system that grants those exceptions rather than just saying nobody has to wear a mask. Have them provide medical documentation from a professional, from a doctor or a mental health professional and mask everyone else because masking everyone else keeps those kids who can't mask safe. Now, I understand that our local Department of Health is not yet recommending this action, but I learned ages ago that when you have a lot of experts who are in agreement and then one person over to the side who's saying that they know the real truth and no one else does, it's much better to base policy on what the experts agree on rather than this one person over here who's claiming special truth. I feel like that's our local Department of Health right now. My second grader returned to school this week, okay? And unfortunately, he takes after his dad. He has breathing problems. They're under control right now, but he has a history of multiple hospitalizations and he carries in him the effects of those traumatic experiences. He wears his mask well, but he is young and he will need to be reminded to do so. However, we know that the mask policy, not the mask policy, the mask itself, doesn't protect him very much. It protects his peers. He understands that when he wears a mask, it's giving him a little bit of protection, but mostly he's protecting others. He understands that masking is about protecting and taking care of each other. When he wears a mask, he does not pre-symptomatically spread COVID to other children who need to be protected from both long and short-term impacts of COVID. Please don't let the few masked children bear the burden of trying to protect their peers. Protect all of our children by requiring masks until every child has had the chance to be vaccinated and our COVID numbers are under control. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch.